Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third lecture in the Fall 2023 Dean's Leaders and Lanyap Lecture Series. The origins of the lecture series comes from a school-wide desire to give our students the opportunity to meet and learn from some of the most distinguished leaders in public health. We aim to give our students the tools and experiences needed to become the next wave of innovative leaders and creating those chance, and creating chances to learn from and engage leaders from around the nation. The lecture series also boasts something distinctly New Orleanian, Lanyap. Lanyap is a concept you'll find around South uh, Louisiana. It's an idea of adding a little something extra or unexpected and perfectly captures the heart, art, and hospitality we show our guests. We have adopted the concept of Lanyap by incorporating the arts into the public health lecture series. Each month accompanying these lectures, we'll be activating the DeBall Gallery to host exhibits combining the arts of public with and public health, providing an alternative expression to the common public health topics. We hope after this lecture, you'll take time to discover the exhibit in the DeBall Gallery titled The Separating Sickness, which explores the lives of the 20th century patients who lived in the Carvel National Laboratorium in Carvel, Louisiana, just up the river from us here in New Orleans. And now let me introduce this month's speakers. Dr. Donna Peterson, Chief Health Officer and Interim Associate Vice Provost for Student Health and Wellness, and is Professor and Dean of the College of Public Health at the University of South Florida. She earned her master's and doctoral degrees in the maternal and child health at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her work has been honored by APHA, Delta Omega, and HRSA, among others. We also have Dr. Nancy Messonnier, Dean of the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health. She is the Bryson Distinguished Professor in Public Health. She has more than 25 years of experience as a public health leader, including as director of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at CDC. Thank you both for being with us here today. So first we'll hear from, first we'll hear from Donna, who will uh, talk a bit about her experience in leadership. Then we'll hear from Nancy, and then I'll, um, I'll host a Q&A and then we'll give you an opportunity to ask them some questions as well. So, Donna. Thank you. Thank you, Dean LaVise. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you, good to see you. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about leadership. Um, I've been in public health 40 years now and since 1990, I've been in leadership positions. I've taught leadership, um, so it is something I think a lot about. So I thought I would uh, share with you some of the best lessons I've learned uh, about leadership being a leader from other leaders, some of which um, may surprise you, hence the title of the, of the discussion. So just to frame this a uh, little bit, I think you all know this already, but public health, I think when we talk about leadership, we have to think about all the ways in which public health leads. So as a field, we lead. Public health as a field has to lead the community in realizing its desires to, to be healthy. And I often ask uh, audiences, especially when I'm speaking out in the community, I, I'll say, okay, please raise your hand if you don't want to be healthy. And everyone looks at me funny and they laugh. And then I talk about what health is. I talk about what public health is and the challenges that public health creates. Because if we're going to create conditions in which people can be healthy, which everyone wants, we have to agree on what those are. And that's where, that's where the challenge lies. As an organization, the, the organizations and institutions responsible for public health, and you all know this in the United States, public health is the responsibility of the state. So those state health agencies that have that responsibility have to lead within those systems. So they have to lead within all the other agencies and try to pull people together and make sure that those conditions that allow people to be healthy exist. And then we need leaders individuals within those organizations, within the community, within the field to move that, move that agenda forward. Um, it's also important that we remember uh, what, our, what, what undergirds what, how we do our work. And so leaders have to be aligned with the things that, uh, that we believe are, are important to us, the, pr the principles that uh, undergird public health, the pursuit of health, health equities, social justice. I was walking around 
your 12th floor where your classrooms are and love to see these words on the walls. That's a great idea. Thank you for doing that. And it's a reminder that these are foundational principles for us. This is what we are working toward. But we do that using the evidence base, for sure. That's part of our, part of our job. We practice ethically. We are transparent. We understand we have to be accountable. We are good stewards of the public's trust and the dollars they invest in us. But also we have to understand that there is wisdom in the community and it's both the scientific quantitative evidence base that's important to us, but also the wisdom that, that the community shares with us. And as leaders, we need to embody the values of public health and act in accordance with them. So um, with that as background, just start with a few uh, thoughts about leadership. And one is, yes, we need leaders, but at the end of the day, we need all of us. We are all interconnected. We are all interdependent. If any of you were children and took dance lessons or have children that took dance lessons, we don't pay dance teachers anywhere near enough for what they put up with nine months of rehearsal. Um, and no, this is not some avant-garde <laughs> dance routine. We should have all been doing the same thing at the same time. And if you can spot an emerging leader up there, probably probably more than one. Um, but we, we always have to recognize, especially in this field, that we are all dependent on each other. We are all interconnected. So uh, some unusual leadership lesson sources. So Shakespeare, uh, King Henry IV, uneasy is the head that wears the crown. Leaders uh, feel, and sometimes people who think they may or may not want to be a leader, they say, I don't want that responsibility. I don't want to be alone. You've heard the expression, it is, uh, it, is, it, is, it is a lonely place to be a leader at the top, right? But the fact of the matter is, um, you will be called to lead. Public health actually demands uh, that we lead, maybe not every day, every minute, but there are times when you will be called to, to lead as an individual or as part of an organization or as part of a field that has to promote public health in the communities that, that we serve. And so understanding that it doesn't have to be a lonely position and you don't have to bear all that weight yourself because as I said in the last slide, we are all interconnected, we are all interdependent. Leaders will bring people together uh, around them and share share um, the burden and also the the joy. So it's important to know who you are and be honest with yourself as as a leader. Know what you're good at. Know what you're not good at, and be honest with yourself. And if you're if you're not sure, well, how how will I know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at? If you're lucky, people will tell you, and and you'll listen graciously. But I just always say it's a gut check. The things that you know you can't sleep the night before your stomach hurts, those are probably things you aren't you aren't so so adept at. The things that really bring you joy and get you excited are probably the things you 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 are good at. But learn to know yourself and trust trust what your gut says. And then I share uh, a former mayor of Tampa, Pam Pam Iorio. I heard her speak to a group of students. This was years ago, but she said, and they they were undergrads. But she said the most important thing is you think about your career and where you're going and how to get where you wanna be. She said, just be interesting for crying out loud, don't be dull. And it's back to know who you are and know what you care about, know what you're, know what you're passionate about. Okay, who am I? How did I get here? You know, yada, yada. I worked my way through college as a short order cook and a cocktail waitress. Um, and when I graduated, what I knew how to do was be a short order cook and a cocktail waitress. So that's what I was doing. And one night when I was cocktail waitressing, this guy had brought his 18 year old son because you could drink at 18 at that time to the men's club where I was waitressing and the kid snapped his fingers at me and said, hey girl, I need another scotch. And I said, hey girl, you need to go to graduate school. So I started looking around, I tripped over public health, I actually tripped over the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health in a graduate catalog, wasn't qualified, but I applied anyway. And thankfully they had been thinking about creating a new program for people who weren't physicians or other clinicians. Because at that time, I'm old enough to get an MPH, you had to already have a, have, a, have a degree in some field. So I was admitted to the Master of Health Science program, did that, worked for the Maryland Department of, of Health, lured back to Hopkins again, because I didn't have an MPH, I couldn't get a DRPH, but as you're already seeing here, my path was always a practice path. That, that was my interest. I wanted to practice public health. So I should have had an MPH and a DRPH because those are our practice degrees, but I don't because that was just the time I, I was there and I was recruited to uh, the, the Minnesota Department of Health um, right after my doctoral degree and ended up running a division at the age of 32, I had half the budget of, of the agency. So if you wanna learn how to be a leader quick, um, dive in, dive into the, to the deep end. Um, 
my husband was at the University of Minnesota, was very unhappy, and as you can see, I was uh, dragged to uh, UAB with him. Uh, if you've heard the trailing spouse concept, they really wanted my husband. They had to find something for me to do. Um, I, was, uh, I was allowed to uh, work in the administration. I was an assistant dean, then an associate, then a senior associate dean. Um, 10 years later, I was recruited to be dean at USF. And again, this practice theme in my life has been important. Our brand at the University of South Florida is our practice is our passion. And when I walked in the door, I felt something that I did not feel when I went in other doors of schools where I, I, I was applying to be dean. So part of being a successful leader is finding a place where there's a fit, where you are aligned with the values, aligned with the culture. So I've been there 20 years. I've done lots of things at the university. And I've done things at the national level, at the local level. These are just a few examples. And I'll refer to them again in a moment. But that's not important. How I got here, I think, is less important than what I think is the important stuff. So the important stuff, if you wanna be a leader, is to get engaged, right? You can't emerge as a leader if no one knows who you are. Say yes when you can, step up, but say yes when you can fulfill what it is you're being asked to do. If you aren't dependable and trustworthy, you won't get asked again. And the reputation you will have will not lend itself to you leading if that's, if that's what you wanna do. Be someone people like to work with. I mean, it's kind of simple, but it's true. And then, you know, we're all teams. We're all collaborators. We're all in this together. Remind yourself you're not the smartest person in the room. And then do not be the smartest person in the room. People like someone who's competent and confident and gets the work done. They do not like someone who is arrogant. All right. The famous philosopher Mick Jagger um, actually said this. And I said, wow, you can't be jealous if you're a leader. And if you've ever, you know, you might not understand what it means, but when you see it in action, you know exa exactly what it means. Leaders need to be encouraging others, creating opportunities for people to succeed, getting out of their way. You cannot resent other people's success, right? You have to understand that you bask in the glow of their, of their success. Another important lesson in, you know, how to be a strong leader, how to have ego strength is not to ever take anything personally, even when it is, particularly when it is. You have to be strong enough to let stuff roll off your back. It's not about you. It's about whatever it is you are trying to achieve. And when you saw some of those national things I've been involved with, if you know the acronyms, I've just been fortunate to be in positions where I'm often leading discussions and conversations about unpopular topics, like the national certification exam, like should uh, public health schools have undergrad programs? Should we change the accreditation criteria? And so I would often not be treated very well at these discussions with my fellow deans, but I always said, I'm not taking any of this personally. And after one particularly brutal beating, Mike Clegg, who was the Dean at Hopkins at the time, who was moderating the session when I was done, he looked at me and he said, man, can you take a punch? And I said, that might be the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me but you have to remember it's not about you, okay? Simple, simple. Mark Twain once said, if you don't lie, you don't have to remember anything. If you always tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. If you lose uh, honesty and integrity, you cannot get it back. So as a leader, it's critically important that you be perceived and be people believe that you are someone that, that they can trust. Okay, another important tip, get really good at listening. And you might say, oh, I listen well, no. This is something you have to practice because usually when we're talking to someone, uh, we're listening, but what we're really doing is thinking about what we're gonna say next. Oh, I've got a story like that. I got something I wanna say, right? You have to teach yourself to really, really listen. And the only thing you should be thinking about is what you're hearing and how you're going to ref reflect that back to the person who is speaking to you, okay? Because as a leader, the conversations you are often having are people uh, who are in crisis, people who are upset, there's a challenge, something's going wrong, there's a threat, you get a call from above that wants to know why something's happening or why something hasn't happened. The conversations are often in that moment of something's wrong, it needs, needs to be fixed. And people will come to you because they're angry, they'll yell at you, right? And you just have to listen and let them speak. And the last Pete part here I learned from my father, which is one of the most important things I learned from him, is you have to be very comfortable with silence, with what I call that dead air space where no one's saying anything. People find that very discomforting. 
And if you listen to what they're yelling, you're listening, you're reflecting back, and then just let it sit. And they'll often, because they can't stand it, because they're uncomfortable. You've learned to be comfortable with it. They're not. They'll start talking. And often they tell you what they're really upset about. And it's usually, they're not angry, they're frightened. That's usually what's going on. They're afraid of something, of losing something, right? And as a leader, you want to move people forward. You want to move the organization forward. You want to move people forward, right? So you need to, you need to get very comfortable with silence because that invites people to tell you what's actually on their mind. The other thing is to be patient. A lot of people who rise to leadership positions are type A. They work hard. They get everything done. Or they want stuff happen immediately. But if there's one thing I've learned over the years, you have got to be patient and let things happen in their own time. Stephen Covey said, change happens at the pace of trust. You know, I put here, your culture sets your pace. What are people comfortable with? How have they been engaged in the conversation? Do they see that change is a good thing? Or do they see it as a, as a, as a huge threat, right? So you have to understand that you know, you're going to take a few steps forward, you're going to take a few steps back. It's OK. And your idea, the one you start with, may well change. Uh, I found it often changes, and often in much improved ways. You know, I have good ideas, but all of you have, have, have good ideas too. And creating the space where those ideas can, 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 can emerge is really important. And this is just one of my favorite quotes of all time from Edna St. Vincent Millay. It's not one damn thing after another. It's the same damn thing over and over again, which is often how it feels as a leader. Really, am I doing this again? But remember why you're doing whatever it is you are doing. Um, again, my mother, what, what a genius. Uh, in, invite them all, they don't all come. That was always her advice when, you were, when I was having parties and I didn't know what to do. Invite them all, they don't all come. And I've, I've uh, um, um, broadened that to say what she's really saying is include everyone. Why would you exclude someone from a conversation? Why would you not invite everyone, right? And that's been really helpful to me over the years because as you'll see in a moment, I'm about to finish here, leadership is really all about change and managing change. And so if, you're, if things are changing, you're going to be disrupting people's comfort level, what they're familiar with, what they're used to doing. And if you've, if you've left them out of the conversation, all you do is create more anxiety, you create uh, distrust. Um, why not include everyone in the conversation? And uh, this has never not served me well. The other great advice my mother gave me, and this goes back to the being comfortable with silence, is to not, not bite, right? So someone comes in your office angry, they're yelling, someone calls you over here, you know, you did this, you know, accusing you of something. And our normal human reaction when threatened is to fight or, or flee, right? The fight flight thing. So you have to train yourself to say, well, there's another alternative, which is I'm just going to sit here and listen. And whatever you say to me, I'm going to say, oh, is that so? And it's amazing how that cuts, you know, someone comes, rah, 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 rah. and if you respond in kind, rah, 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 you know, then the argument just, just escalates. If you say, oh, is that so? They say, yes, it is. Well, yeah, it is. And then that's comfortable with the silence. And then they'll eventually say, well, okay, here's, here's what's really going on, right? It's the same kind of thing. Do not engage. As a leader, your job is to create calm, <laughs> energy, positive energy, coalescing, bringing people together. Your job is not to be contributing to, to, to the conflict. And then, you know, just be fun. Be someone people want, want to be around. And part of this is expressing uh, your humble side. And it's important to be humble. Uh, we don't know everything just because we wear the crown. Uh, that doesn't mean we know everything. The wisdom's in the community. The community can be your own, your own community. Um, and be willing to step up and do the goofy stuff because it just endears people to, to, to you, if I can say so. And yes, I'm pretty good at the hula hoop. <laughs> okay, I'm almost done. Look for, look for things that spark your thinking about what it means to be a leader. So I'm on a plane. If you've ever read Louise Penny, she has written this amazing series of murder mysteries featuring a, uh, the chief inspector of the Montreal Police Department. He's the homicide head of homicide. His name is Armand Gamache. And if you haven't read them, they're marvelous books. But if you have read them, um, she's a marvelous, uh, she, she evokes incredible imagery and the settings and the people. And these are people that you feel like, you, like, you, like you've come, come to know. So when Armand Gamache is recruiting people to the homicide division, he tells them that it, you know, as part of their job, you know, homicide detectives, they're there to find the truth. 
And he says, the way you do that is understand the power of being able to say out loud these four phrases. Now put this in a leadership context. Imagine you're a, imagine you're a leader or think about leaders you have known. And think about a leader saying to you, I don't know, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I need help. Not typical leadership training, you know, this is what you say. Again, an element of humbleness. These are not signs of weakness. These are not signs of indecisiveness. They are, these are signs of, I understand that we are all interconnected and interdependent. Your success and my success are linked. How we move this agenda forward is the most important thing. It's not about me. And, and I'm going to open myself up and invite in your uh, camaraderie, your partnership, your strength. And I was, I'm reading this on a plane and I yelled out loud, oh my God, everyone says, what? And I just start talking and I end, I end up doing like a little leadership workshop up in the front of the front of the, front of the plane. <laughs> But I could probably have distilled this whole talk to this slide. I think if you take anything away from this, it's this. So I said before, leadership is all about managing change. Who here thinks nothing has to change? Public health is fine. Everything's good. No, right? It's changing constantly. And partly it's the same old stuff. Like, really, am I dealing with this again? And then it's all the new stuff, right? This is a very dynamic field. Stuff is happening all the time. So leaders are, that is their job, to help manage change. If it's about managing change, it's about those relationships, how we pull together other elements of the system, how we lead the community, um, how we relate to, uh, to other people. If it's about nurturing relationships, it is about people. And if it's about people, it must be about kindness. This is my last slide. Uh, I have learned over a 40 year career, 30 plus years in leadership, that I think the most important thing leaders can do and need to do is to be kind. My mother again, do you wanna have friends or do you wanna be right? Okay, leaders, again, we can be big, strong, tough leaders and we're always right in our say, you know, I said so. Or we can say, hey, you know what? It's more important that I build these relationships that we work together to create the change that's important. As Maya Angelou famously said, people won't remember what you said or what you did, but they will remember how you made them feel. And you all know that. You can all remember in vivid detail when someone made you feel badly. And that's not a leader's job. A leader's job is to make you feel great about what you do and the work you're doing because public health depends on it. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thanks. Well, I'm glad to say that we actually didn't know each other very well before today. Um, but I see themes of what I'm gonna talk about and what you said in your words of wisdom. So thank you. Um, I took a slightly different tact here, but I'm gonna talk about the arc of my career and hopefully weave in there some of the things that I've learned about leadership. And I would start by saying that I never set out to be a leader and I certainly never set out to be a public health leader. I think part of leadership is the willingness to step up when there is the need to do so and the opportunity to do so and being willing to sort of put yourself out there and take those risks. So um, I did my undergraduate at University of Pennsylvania. I went to Chicago for medical school and I went back to Penn for my residency in internal medicine. Um, this is around 1995 and in 1995, there weren't any limits on how many hours you were allowed to spend in the hospital. So after three years of on call every third or fourth night, um, I was pretty burnt out and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I had planned to pursue a career in primary care medicine, but I was 30 and I wanted to do something fun for a couple of years. And so I um, applied for and then surprisingly got into this two-year fellowship at the CDC called the Epidemic Intelligence Service. And I figured I'd spend two years at CDC having adventures and traveling the world. And I mean, obviously I never looked back. Um, you should also see looking at this that I actually have none of the degrees that the school in which I am dean offers. <laughs> um, I left CDC um, and I will talk about that a little bit. I spent a year at a private foundation calling, called the Skull Foundation, then I landed at UNC 
um, about a year ago. And at the bottom, you will see the two footprints. At CDC, the Epidemic Intelligence Service has this um, little cartoon, which is your shoe with a hole at the bottom because you spend so much time doing shoe leather epidemiology and UNC are the Tar Heels. And so maybe it was destined that I was gonna end up in the job, I don't know. Um, I am really fortunate to have an amazing career at CDC full of surprising things and surprising opportunities where I actually had the opportunity from very early on to sort of have national, international impact setting, um, you know, within my first year national vaccine policy. Um, I think we all look back at our points in our career and maybe have some of the stories that are really formative. And so for me, one of the most, well, these are two of the most formative stories, but the one on the right is a map of Africa. And the area that you see highlighted is something called the meningitis belt. Um, the meningitis belt in Africa had had peaks of bacterial meningitis disease every year. And then on top of that, these large epidemics that occurred every 10 to 12 years. In 1996, the second year after I got to CDC, there were 350,000 cases of meningitis in four months in around four or five countries in West Africa. But 1996 was before social media. And so people who lay dying in the fields outside clinics because they couldn't get a single shot of antibiotics weren't visible to the widespread world. But there are a lot of themes that resonate, inadequate surveillance, inadequate response, and an insufficient vaccine that actually wouldn't prevent these epidemics. 1996, the problem was that the strain of meningitis that was causing disease in West Africa was different than the strain in industrialized countries and the major pharmaceutical companies wanting to make a profit were not gonna make a vaccine. So it was an orphan vaccine. And in the late nineties at the very onset of the Gates Foundation and within five years of being at CDC, I with two people from World Health Organization and two people from an NGO went to the Gates Foundation and secured $70 million to make a vaccine, which I thought was more money than I would ever see again. And it took 10 years, but we eventually got a vaccine, vaccinated the countries in West Africa and eliminated meningitis epidemics. Now I tell you that story because I hope that all of you at some point in your career have that feeling of the amazing impact of your work, but also because I bet you've never heard this story. Um, it was the story of a small group of people um, working on a disease that frankly is outside the public eye compared with TB, HIV, malaria, but who pulled a village of other people together to make a tremendous public health impact. Um, one of the most gratifying things I've ever worked on. And honestly, um, as I moved through CDC, I started as a ground leather epidemiologist and kept kind of getting moved up almost without my sort of almost without intention. Um, and I was able to move at CDC and do a bunch of different things. I thought that was it. I thought I was sort of sliding towards the end of my career. My last job at CDC was as a director of the Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. Those of you who don't know CDC, there's no reason you would, um, should know that that's where CDC runs the US vaccination program. And that's also the program at CDC that has responsibility for coronavirus. So that's how I ended up in charge of the COVID pandemic at CDC. So um, in early 2000, if you were listening to any media, you would have heard my voice if I don't sound familiar because I was a CDC spokesperson in the early days of the pandemic. And the thing that you might need to know is that I'm the person who in late February warned the country that we were gonna have a pandemic. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, the stock market crashed. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I got the president's attention. Talk about taking a punch. Um, and I really thought about throwing in the towel because who wants to be getting hate mail and reporters knocking at their door? Um, it's a moment when I asked myself, you know, what's my integrity worth and how do I keep going and why? But my day job was vaccines. It's what I had spent my career building towards. And I knew that if there wasn't um, 
an effective vaccine program in the, U in the US, then our pandemic would last a lot longer. So I stayed, I stayed for a year to launch the US vaccination program. Um, Donna showed a slide a bit like this, and I wanna go back to this, because I think when you're faced with these kind of situations of something where the entire world feels like it's going crazy, you have to ask yourself what matters to you. What's the most important thing? And to me, it was this question of health equity that whatever we were gonna do with the vaccination program with all the forces that were pushing against us and all the headwinds that tried to decide what we were gonna do, the most important thing to me was making sure that everyone had equal access to the vaccine and that the vaccine was used to the extent possible um, to have the maximum public health impact. I can't say that it was completely successful, but I do feel like one of the characteristics of being a leader is knowing who you are, knowing what matters to you, and no matter what happens, you still have to wake up every day and look at the mirror, and you have to look at your husband and your family and your kids and be true and ethical and determined to do what you think is right. And this notion of health equity, frankly, for me, was a driving force around those vaccination programs. Um, I think we should be really proud of the fact that we rolled out the vaccine quickly and that it saved lots of lives and that I bet most of you in the room had some role in that. For me, I look back and think, after this thing happened in West Africa, I thought that would be the only moment that I had like that. But I can tell you that I, for one, cried the day that the vaccine rolled off the airplanes into people's arms. And that um, my daughter will tell you that I cried when she got her vaccine. Um, and to me, that was sort of the moment when I felt like this is what I worked for. This is what matters to me. I accomplished what I set out to do. I took all those punches, but it was worth it. But by spring of 2021, I was kind of done. Two years of a pandemic, two years of taking punches, two years of feeling like every day I had to fight the ethical good fight. Um, I was weary, so I left after um, 26 years at CDC. And I feel fortunate. You know, you have these moments in your life when you have to make a decision based on incomplete knowledge. I think we all kind of want to know perfectly what the next job is going to be. And sometimes you kind of have to jump. So I jumped. I landed at this nonprofit called the Skull Foundation. I am sure you never heard of it, that's fine. Um, I feel really fortunate. There are lots of nonprofits. They all behave really differently. Um, this nonprofit was a great fit, 65 people. They treated me really well. If you ever have the opportunity in your career to be the one giving out the money, I would highly recommend it because it's a lot of fun. And you also would be surprised to learn that um, a lot of these nonprofits, while they don't realize it, they're basically doing public health, right? Because people don't realize that kind of everything is public health. If you're talking about um, social justice, if you're talking about safe housing, it's all public health. And that's when I found when I got there. I was the only MD. I was the only official um, epidemic um, expert. But frankly, they were all doing public health and um, by another name. I also realized how siloed we had become at CDC. Um, and I think that's a common refrain from all of us, despite our best efforts, that if you stay within the same edifice for too long, you lose sight of what's around you and you lose sight of all the assets that are actually available, all the strategic partnerships. You lose sight of the community that can really support you. And I learned that a lot about Skull Foundation. One of the reasons I really liked being there is because their vision is a sustainable world of peace and prosperity for all. Doesn't that sound like public health? Um, they also really believe strongly that the people closest to the work know what needs to get done and that the role of funders is to fund them because they need money, but it's also really to champion them basically to give up your seat at the table so that they have a seat at the table. And one of the reasons you've probably never heard of this foundation is unlike some of the other foundations, the leaders of the Skull Foundations aren't interested in themselves getting visibility. For them, a triumph is if the people that they support actually are in front of the camera. I think that's a nice lesson for all of us as we think about our jobs as leaders in public health. We actually 
strive to be invisible. And if we're doing our jobs well, people actually don't even know what we're doing. Um, I had expected to stay at the school foundation for at least a couple of years. It was a good gig. I liked it. People were really good to me. Um, but then I got a call from the search, um, the head of the search firm, sorry, the head of the search committee for UNC, that they were recruiting for a dean. And um, it was sort of too hard an opportunity to pass up. So <laughs> I was invited to UNC to give a lecture. Now, you have to remember that I spent my entire career outside of academic public health, right? I have never had an academic position. I didn't come up through the ranks. Um, and when they invited me to give a lecture, you probably all know what that is, but I actually had no idea what it was. <laughs> and now, having seen lots of people give these lectures, I recognize that I perhaps didn't approach it as lots of people did. But I was asked, like, what are the priorities and opportunities? And I date this as 523. And I said this, not really knowing that much about academics or UNC, but I kind of think mostly that it was kind of right as to where things are. And maybe, oh, that's absolutely wrong. It's 521. So a year and a half later, as I think about it, I kind of think most of these things were probably pretty right. And I would add some things to the list now. I'd add generative AI probably. Um, but I, you know, I think these things are still on our radar as the things that hopefully um, are still sort of important to us in public health. And then I got the job, surprisingly, <laughs> and I ended up at Gillings. Um, it's an amazing place. It's much larger than most public health schools. Um, but one of the things that I think is really amazing is um, the graduation rate, 94%, and that 98% of our graduates had jobs or continuing education the year after they graduated. So we're not just successful in producing great minds. We're successful in getting our students where they need to be. We're also a research powerhouse, number one in NIH funding. And we work throughout the state and throughout the world. We're proudly public. It impacts us in ways that I didn't anticipate. Um, with the mission solidly in the state of North Carolina, of the state, for the state, our undergraduates still pay $9,000 tuition for in-state. It's been like that for seven years. And we have a real mission to educate the population of North Carolina, which is inherent in everything we do. So I feel really fortunate. Another one of these things that I kind of didn't intend to do and kind of fell into. Um, the school is a little overwhelming at times. Um, we have a number of, um, of departments and after a year there, what I find a lot is how little I know about all the topics that we work on. Um, there is not many topics where I can't find somebody at the school who has researched it, has papers on it, has funding on it, and has deeper thoughts than I have ever imagined. And so the, the humility thing stares me in the face every day when faced with this. Um, I also, think that in this wealth of all these great things, sometimes it's hard to figure out who you are and what your place is and how you can shape the things around you. And it took me a while to figure out that, in fact, this is great, but I can still champion causes that I care about. So, you know, we're one of only two environmental sciences and engineering departments within the School of Public Health. And I'm championing a bunch of work on climate and health, which is something that um, I think is gonna impact all of our lives. We have a set of activities around um, behavioral health, mental health, clearly important to all of us. And clearly by championing it, I can elevate the importance of it within the school and within the university. Um, I would say the same thing, frankly, with maternal morbidity, a huge issue in the state of North Carolina. So even if you are at times, I think, um, intimidated by all the things that you don't know, if you're a leader and you practice humility, and you understand that you're not the smartest person in the room, having the ability to pull people together and being willing to ask the questions actually really goes a long way. And I think some leaders aren't comfortable in the space of admitting how much you don't know. But since I got to UNC and I knew I didn't know a lot of things, it's actually been pretty easy to admit I don't know and to get people together to talk about these topics. Another thing which harkens back to exactly what you said, so I'm happy to say it, is I also think you do have to know you, 
who you are and what you care about. Um, our school is a research powerhouse. We are very student focused, um, but the weakest part of our three-legged stool is our practice. And I come from a completely practice background. My, um, my whole ethos is what's the point of making public health innovations? It's not for publications, although those are nice. It's not to get more money from NIH, although we all need that. What we really strive to do is change the world. Isn't that why you're going into public health? So interventions that are sitting on the shelf are 0% effective. We have to be part of the practice of public health. For me, a lot of that is focused in the state and globally. We need to make sure that the interventions that we find and discover actually help the communities that we're working in. I'm almost done. I will finally say that these are three slides from these three different phases of my life. One is the people lined up with their vaccination cards to get their meningitis vaccine in Burkina Faso. One, the one below it is um, people in a nursing home also having just waited for their COVID vaccines. And then the one up top is from um, Chapel Hill. Um, being a leader can be lonely. I'm at Chapel Hill. I came because of the science, but I'm going to stay because of the community. And I think that's a really important lesson as a leader not to go it alone. And that one of the best things that you can do is develop the community of people around you to support you and support each other. It's been a little bit of a tense time in Chapel Hill, as I think it has been on many campuses. The Supreme Court affirmative action decision um, had a major impact on us emotionally, if not functionally. We had a shooting on campus um, with our students hiding under their desks for two or three hours waiting for campus to be cleared. Um, and uh, um, the distress in the Middle East has impacted us greatly. When I look at the people that I work with, our students, faculty, and staff, the thing that holds us together is each other and the community that we've built and the respect for each other and being around a group of people that share the same values that you do, I think that's also a really important lesson as a leader is to surround yourself with those kind of people who share a sense of mission and vision and goal. I've been fortunate at CDC and at the Skoll Foundation and at UNC to have found those kind of communities. It is really what nurtures me. I'll end with this slide. It's a little hard to see, but that's my daughter rock climbing. Um, I don't rock climb myself, but I do think that there are some analogies in how you think about your career. You think you're going to get to the top and be at the top, but there's always another hill to climb. I kind of thought after my career at CDC that that was it, my career at CDC. And yet I have found myself sort of going forward and seeking other adventures. And I think um, if you're brave and if you're willing to take some risks, Frankly, public health offers tremendous opportunities to have tremendous impact. And I really hope that, um, that all of you students are able to have the kind of career that I have. Thank you. Okay, please join me at the front room. Thank you for those presentations. Um, I know that we're we're approaching one o'clock, and I know many of you will have to leave for, for classes, so we won't um, won't be labor to point very much. Uh, what I want to do is give any students an opportunity to ask any questions you might have um, before I start asking my question, because I know that so many of you are going to have to leave. So as you get ready, and who has the microphone for the audience? Okay. So if you could just raise your hand, and um, we'll bring the mic out to you. In the meantime, while while you tee up for that. Oh, was that a hand? No. Yeah. Okay. As as we tee up for that, I had I had a question and an, an observation, something that came through both of your presentations. And Donna, I think you you may have actually alluded to it. You were talking about leadership not being about stepping up when opportunities present themselves. And your your I think your um, your example, your your story is all about stepping up when opportunities present themselves. But you can't always predict when those opportunities are going to come. So we need to be prepared so that when those opportunities come, that we're ready to step into those leadership opportunities. What would you tell our students they should be doing so that, that they're positioned so that when opportunities do arise, that they have the skill set, they have the confidence, they have the ability to step up into those leadership opportunities? 
So I think you have wonderful opportunities as students in pretty safe spaces. And what I mean by that is, you know, lives aren't at risk. Um, but there are, I'm sure, organizations, I'm sure there are events, I'm sure there are things that happen here at this school that you can volunteer to join, right? Joining student organizations, running to be an officer in one of those, one of those organizations. When Greta or somebody calls, you know, we need volunteers to do this, stepping up, learning what it means to be part of a team, feeling what it feels like to be responsible for a task, right? In this space, they're, they're typically shorter term. And as I said, typically lives aren't, lives aren't at risk. And that gives you a feel for what you're good at, what you're maybe not good at. The other thing, I'm sure um, you have group projects in your classes that you all hate, except we all do that for a reason. It's because of everything we've said. You don't do this alone. So even just testing out how you manage in a group, are you the one that steps up and says, "Let I'll organize the meetings? Are you the one that says, I'll do the final editing of the, pro you know, who are you? What What is it that you step up to do? Because all of those are transferable skills so that when somebody from the APHA calls you and says, hey, would you be willing to join the student caucus and run this event? It's not foreign to you. It's not unfamiliar to you. You can say, yeah, I've, I've done something like that. I'm, I'd like to try. Yeah, um, I guess I agree with you about that. I think being a good team member first is an important part about learning to be a leader um, and leading in small ways. Another thing that I think is really important and I wouldn't be where I am if I hadn't had good um, mentors and sponsors. Um, mentors give you advice, but sponsors actually push you forward when you don't think you're ready for it. Um, and I remember really clearly one of my first um, leadership positions um, as a branch chief at CDC, I didn't think I was ready to apply for the job. And one of my sponsors like held me by the hand and pushed me forward. And I think you need those people in your lives who um, help you get off the starting box, um, even when you're a little afraid yourself to be the visible person. What advice can you give on how you can find sponsors and mentors to, to help you in that way? How do you create that? And once you have that relationship, how do you nurture it and keep it going? I mean, I do think that as leaders, we're all responsible to pay it forward by being those sponsors and mentors that we wish we had had. Um, for people that are in the early stages of career, I think you can look for those mentors and sponsors in unexpected places. They're not always your supervisor. Sometimes they're somebody who's just a half step ahead of you, um, or sometimes they're somebody that's a colleague in a different location or a different place. So I think you have to feel comfortable thinking outside the box and look for somebody that you really sync with. And then frankly, you have to ask. I, um, I, have, a, I have two kids or teenagers and trying to convince them to ask people to help them is really difficult. So mm -hmm. I, I don't say this thinking that it's easy, but um, I, I know that many of our faculty and staff and more senior people are happy to help if somebody just asks them. And so I also think to be brave enough to ask somebody to help you, I think is really important. That's, I'm, I'm so glad you, you, you said that. And I, cause what I was thinking was, you know, if you haven't figured this out already, people like to talk about themselves so you can, make an appointment and say, you know, how did you get here? Why are you doing this? You know, how did you do this? I'm just curious because I'm on, I'm on my own journey. And you can create then a, an opportunity for that conversation to continue. I think the, the fit is really important. I mean, find someone that, that syncs with you, that seems to, that seems to understand you. Um, but I, I, the, the asking for help is, is always a challenge. And I, again, you're in, an op, you're in this window here. The time is gonna go by here so fast, you're not gonna believe it. And you've got this incredible building full of scholars and professionals, leaders who are eager to help you. That's why they chose this profession. They could have gone somewhere else, but they're here. And so they want you to ask them. They want you to ask them for, for, for help. They want you to ask them for, for guidance. And those, and your question, how do you keep those relationships alive? Well, you know, that's on you as well. You can drop a little thank you note. You can call and let them know how you're doing when you've left here. We'd love to hear from our alumni. There's nothing greater than 
someone calling and saying, I just got a promotion or I got this great new job or, you know, that class of yours I hated. I actually now realize why you mm -hmm. taught me what you taught me. We love to get those messages Especially back. that one. <laughs> that <laughs> one. But then as you, and then when you, again, you got to get comfortable with stuff, get comfortable asking, get comfortable saying, wow, I really enjoyed your talk. Could we grab a cup of coffee? Or if not, could I follow up with you later? Getting comfortable with that. And then building a net a network of people, you know, go to APHA and meet people and get their, I guess you don't get cards anymore. You, it's on your phone or something. I don't understand. Ooh. But, you know, and, but keep them going, drop them a line. How are you doing? You know, whatever happened, how was your presentation, right? That's how you build, that's how you build uh, relationships. And you'll be surprised, you know, years later, you may say, wow, you know what, you know, who could help me with this? Thomas. And he'll say, Donna, yes. How, how may I help you? Even though it might be 10 years from now. You know, um, I was talking to a colleague recently at the business school at UNC, and um, when people go to business school for an MBA, they're going to build their network. Like they're um, concretely planning to build their network of colleagues. And I don't think we think about it in public health school mm -hmm. as a specific reason to choose a school or a specific deliverable out of a school. But if you're not taking advantage of those networks, including with your peers, with your peers, you're missing opportunities. Because in fact, a lot of those things do come back eventually to be really helpful. I'm so glad you said that because you know one one of the things that I found is that it's hard to be, it's it's hard to when you're at home, people don't necessarily take what you say as seriously. You just said something that I say all the time that the people sitting in, in that classroom with you are going to be running public health <laughs> for the planet. Yep, yep. And you just never know. The person sitting next to you might be the next secretary of yep. World Health Organization or CDC. And that network, you're going to be communicating with these people for the rest of your lives. So you should definitely avail yourself of making those connections with them. So. We had a question over here. Oh, great. Yes. Um, thank you guys for your talk. Um, my question is for Dr. Peterson. Um, I am also from Florida. Um, how has the changing policy landscape impacted the way you're currently educating your public health students? And how have you adjusted to that? Thank you for that question. I'm sure it's not a secret to all of you that Florida is under um, some pretty severe challenges right now uh, regarding Everything that the university does around diversity, equity, inclusion, we were recently told to um, disband any organization of students that had anything to do with Palestine because it, they were terrorist organizations. Um, the, we, if we bring in a speaker, we have, to, we have to have a counter speaker, except they never want us to bring in our speakers. They only want the other, we said, well, you said you wanted both. Um, and the discussions about race, we're not supposed to discuss anything that makes anyone uncomfortable. We're not supposed to talk about history. Um, but in public health, we can't not talk about the things that impact health. We can't not talk about the social determinants of health and the social determinants of health have their origins in the racist history and the racist policies that created the United States. That's what we have today and that it is part of our job to uh, recognize, interrogate, and then do everything we can to dismantle those systems and those structures. So we aren't going to stop talking about those things because we cannot. And uh, you know, I will tell you honestly, I, I teach the first part of our uh, integrated core curriculum um, designed for the MPH, but all of our incoming graduate students, if they don't have an MPH, take that class. And um, there's a reading assignment before you come. And I give you a list of books and they're all about the history of r r race relations and racism in the United States. And you have to pick one and you have to read it and you have to write me a paper on what you think about that. And I ask you a series of questions. And my faculty were absolutely hysterical when all this was happening in the legislature and the governor and the, what you hear in the media. And they said, you can't have that reading assignment because you'll get fired and we don't want you to be fired. And I said, well, I'm not gonna change my summer reading assignment and I'm not going to get fired. And if I do get fired, okay, fine. And so they kept arguing with me. So in the end, what I did was add, so they still have to read a book. And then I gave them some articles that I didn't find, somebody else found them. One from the Heritage Foundation, one from a, um, some kind of, I don't remember what the name of the other group was, but anyway, there were, there were three articles that sort of look at race, r r r r racial equity kind of issues in different ways from, from different perspectives. And lo and behold, the students actually appreciated reading those and actually seemed to get a lot out, it, that it actually helped them interpret the book to read these articles mm -hmm. from these different perspectives. So it actually turned out to be a positive, which is back to my, let people engage in your conversations and help you help you help you grow your 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 ideas. 
So I've been doing this, I don't know how many years, I can only think of two people, two students that said they were offended by the assignment and you know, didn't think they should have to do it, but no one has fired me yet. I'm still, I'm still here. So that's important as a leader to, to decide what matters to you. As Nancy said, you know, what's important, what's the right thing to do. If I caved, we might as well turn off the lights and, and leave, because as I said, this is, this is what public health is. So we haven't changed our curriculum one bit. We haven't changed our courses one bit. The only thing we did, we were about to put out our strategic plan that had anti-racism all over it. And we just said, eh, you know, do we really have to poke people in the eye with that? So everything's in there except that word is not, it's the words in there, it's just not prominently on the, on the cover. That was the one concession that, that we made. But um, we can't, you can't teach public health and mm -hmm. not talk about these things, you just can't. Yeah. Any other questions from students? Yeah, we have another question over here. Uh, hi, uh, I have two questions. One is regarding conflict at the workplace. Like if you're managing a team and there's conflict and people are constantly venting to you, um, you know, I understand that a leader has to be calm, uh, but is there a point, like if what if it's a pattern uh, and what are the boundaries? Uh, you know, like I feel leaders would feel like punching bags too. So how do you define those boundaries and how do you manage that is there a second yes uh, the second question is about burnout um i feel there's i mean i don't i don't even know the figures about burnout in students or like staff in universities uh, and how is that managed uh, or what are like some good tips to manage that i'm laughing because i was hoping the second question would be easier <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's good. Those are really good questions. Thank you. Do you have an initial thought um, while I'm thinking? Yeah, I guess um, in the first question, um, you certainly can't be any kind of leader at any level without dealing with conflict at some level. I think it's inherent on us. I also think it's really important to set rules and boundaries about what's acceptable. And that um, you know, in one of my jobs, um, I we got reorganized, CDC tends to do that. And I ended up with a group of people. And when I kind of um, got this group of people, I was told that like their pattern was like standing in the hallway and yelling at each other. Like, I know, but like, no, like that's that's not okay, right? So I do think there is something about understanding where the boundaries are. I also have had some colleagues where everybody constantly came in their office and um, engaged them in their personal lives and they could never get any work done. And so I do think you have to find the balance of where you're comfortable um, and sort of what's okay to come to you about and um, to organize yourself in a way that you're not the only one that gets the brunt of all that. I also would say on the opposite side that some conflict is good. If it's if it's respectful conflict, I think um, on the opposite side is when people, and tell me you all haven't had this experience where people are in a meeting and everybody wants to be nice to each other. Nice is good, but nice to each other to the point where they're unwilling to disagree with each other. Mm -hmm. And then everybody leaves the meeting and ends up in your office telling you why they didn't agree with what everybody talked about. And then you have to have another meeting to bring everybody back together. So I do think that you as a leader can set a model of what respectful disagreement looks like. And that um, by sort of modeling the behavior that you wanna see, you can actually help the people around you engage in a way that's respectful as opposed to sort of what you th typically think of as conflict, which is where things escalate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's all true. And I think making expectations clear, there is some behavior that's just not okay. And people have to be called out immediately and said that's not okay. But I will say, if I haven't witnessed, if I've witnessed it, okay, that's easy. But if someone comes to me and says someone so-and-so is doing something, um, I always ask them first to tell me, gee, what happened in that meeting or what happened in that conversation? Because there's two sides to every story. And sometimes what they tell you, you say, oh, well, this was a 
a misunderstanding, which it often is. It's just someone misinterpreted what, what someone said. And you can usually work those, work those things out. But sometimes what they tell me makes it even worse. Like, wow, you're even worse than the person said you said you were. Um, but again, then you can explain what's not acceptable in this, in this environment. But it also gets back to why are people behaving badly in the first place? And often, as I said, it's often because they're, they're afraid of something, they're worried about something, you know, and it comes out in this sort of odd way, this not productive way, and giving them the space to, to tell you. The other thing I've learned over the years, and I, it's so funny, people say, well, you can't do that. I said, well, I'm, I have to be honest with this person. I, when I got to USF, there was one faculty member in particular that had just been bounced around from, you know, this program to that department, to that center, to that. And she was, she had filed a grievance because she was upset at the way she'd been treated. And when I did my investigating to find out what was going on, it just turned out she was impossible to work with. Like no one could work with this woman. She was brilliant, but impossible to work with. And I said, well, I just have to tell her the truth. And they said, well, you can't tell her that. I said, but I have to tell it. it. So, you know, I did it in a nice way, a kind way. And she, you know, after we had this conversation, she said, no one has ever told me that. No one has ever explained that to me. She dropped the grievance and she left. Um, and, and in a good, you know, she ended up leaving in a good, healthy way, you know. But sometimes you just have to tell people the truth. And then again, the conflicts are off, they're often not about what they seem to be about, right? There's there's something, there's always something underlying why this, why this behavior is happening. But I also want to emphasize something she said that's really important. It's not about all being nice and all agreeing all the time. It's that good God, you won't get anywhere. So you have to create the space. You have to model the kind of behavior that says, hey, it's okay to voice an opinion. It's okay to disagree. It's okay to, you know, have the, the hustle, tussle, whatever that, you know, the storming, norming, forming, all that stuff is important because you, know, you have to get everybody's ideas out. And there's, there's ways to do that that you can read about and learn and, and, and see. The burnout stuff is really challenging. It's really, really hard. And, and you know, don't let anyone tell you, oh, work on your work-life balance. There's no such thing. It's, that's ridiculous. Um, you do need to nourish yourself. You do need to take care of your family. Um, you know, and as deans, I often tell people who are looking at these positions, you know, make sure you get time to do what nourishes your soul, whatever it is. Do you want to keep your lab going? Do you want to keep your advisory board roles? Uh, you know, do you want to teach? you have to do something that's yours because you will get sucked dry if you don't. Yeah, you know, um, maybe one thing I'll add is one of the things I didn't fully understand until I was in one of these senior leadership positions is how visible you are everywhere you go. Um, I don't think this is as true perhaps in New Orleans, which is a big city, but- uh, you, you know, might be surprised. I'm yeah. very much <laughs> resonating with what you right. said. Yeah. Chapel Hill is a small city. I mean, if I just worked out and I'm all sweaty and icky and I'm like running into the store, invariably I run into somebody who I know. And the same thing was true in the town I lived in in Atlanta. Um, and like, not every day I'm on my best self. And I think, you know, we all know that we're not our best selves every moment of every day. And I don't think that's any different from our leaders as it is anybody else. And so I also think there's something about giving each other a little bit of grace and it's sort of assuming positive intent. And I think sometimes we're so quick to snap to judgment that we um, assume somebody is thinking something when they just, they, the wrong word came out or right. they misspoke or exactly. they didn't fully think through something before they said it. So I really do think yep. that grace is important. The one, I mean, I, I agree with you work-life balance a little bit, but I will say that um, I feel like I've had seasons of my career. And when my kids were young, um, I had a very firm time that I was leaving work. I mean, except if the sky was falling, I was leaving work because um, I was going to go home and I was going to make dinner for my family and I was going to um, have time to take care of my husband and my kids and the multiple pets. And then I would go back to work. Um, so I do think that with the right you have to be really solid about it, but I do think that work-life balance is possible. Um, and that, you know, if we insist upon it for ourselves, then it models that behavior also for younger people. And that we as a society need to find ways to draw lines around what's work and what's life, or, you know, this burnout thing, which is totally real, keeps getting worse. You, you pour yourself into your job and you don't leave any of you left. That's not healthy for our society. And so I think calling it out 
um, and figuring out what nurtures you, but also giving your peers space as well. Um, you know, giving people a little bit of grace when the person that you're working with tells you that they got to go home early because they got to take their kid to their soccer game. For sure. You know, and so also um, nurturing our communities, nurturing each other is also part of, I think, the solution to burnout. Yeah, and I never send an email or a text in the evening or the weekend so that when I do, people know it's important. Yeah, yep. Well, I think this is a great place to, to end. Uh, thank you all for staying in and hanging in a little longer. Um, yes. But before we depart, a few, a few announcements. Uh, we hope you'll mark your calendar for the next Dean's Leaders and Lanyap Lecture Series, Wednesday, December 6th. We'll be joined by Dean Hillary Godwin of the University of Washington School of Public Health and Dean Sandro Galea of the Boston University School of Public Health. I'd also highly encourage those of you here in person to stick around a bit for the lanyard in the DeBall Gallery. We have a very special exhibit named uh, Separating Sickness, all about the lives of patients at the Carville National Laboratorium in Carville, Louisiana. Sponsored by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, this exhibit was curated by Carville resident Ann Brett, whose parents were patients at the facility and took many of the fo uh, photographs in the exhibit. Thank you again for hanging around and we'll see you next time.